These are Nebraska corn farmers. They work in acres, not hours, harvesting the energy and climate solutions the world needs. We are proud to stand with you. The success of tomorrow's soy industry depends on the actions we take today. The future is here, and the time to move is now. Market Journal Television for Agricultural Business Decisions is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources in partnership with the Nebraska Rural Radio Association. Promotional support provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine and partial funding provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Well, thanks so much for joining us today on Market Journal. I'm Bryce Duskett. A lot of planters are out rolling as we drive down the interstate and join you today from Bruning, Nebraska. We'll be visiting with the local producer as he shares an update when it comes to his planting progress. We're in Heather Ramsey country, so she swung by our mobile studio to give us a look at what's happening when it comes to the grain markets. And as always, weatherman Eric Hunt is standing by to share with us what we can expect with weather into the next week. That's a look at what's coming up here on the broadcast, but we begin here. Beautiful spring-like day today, and of course, summer quickly approaching. That means that UNL Extension Field Days are right around the corner. The first one is actually coming up this next Tuesday, that's April 30th, at the Haskell Ag Lab near Concord, Nebraska. They'll be hosting a cover crops field day that will include tours, as well as some different research updates. The program kicks off at 1 p.m. with an in-depth look at USDA NRCS funded research plots dedicated to evaluating different fertilizer values of cereal rye cover crops. The second stop features another USDA funded initiative with a review of cover crop varieties. The final stop of the day will include uh, an introduction to USDA NIFA funded studies that conduct integrated use of cover crops, mulch and manure management strategies to mitigate nitrate leaching in cornfields. This field day will provide an opportunity to learn about leading research efforts and give producers a chance to engage with experts in the field. Again, the field day will begin at 1 p.m. and end at 3 p.m. at the University of Nebraska Haskell Ag Lab, which is located near Concord, Nebraska. The event is free to attend and you have until this coming Monday, that's the 29th, to pre-register for the event. For more information, you're encouraged to reach out to the Extension educators focused on that area. Their contact information is on the bottom of your screen now, and we'll be sure to include that information with a registration link along with this story. Find that on the Market Journal website. We're just north of Strang, Nebraska, visiting now with Lance Viola for our In the Field update. Lance, appreciate you letting us come out here, check in on your planting progress. We'll visit about that here in a second, but first, tell me a little about the operation. Ah, uh, we corn and soybeans, uh, a little heavier on the corn. That's, you know, we just grain farm, I guess, no livestock. Yep. We winter cows in the winter, I guess that's about it. So planting progress, driving down the interstate down uh, south of York. Uh, you could see where everybody was based on the dust flying in the air. A lot of planters rolling here as you and I visit it midweek. How do you sit planting progress wise? We got a, a day left of corn and probably two days left on beans. Seems like at this point, a lot of people trying to beat some, some incoming rain. Fingers crossed on the rain. <laughs> rain would be nice. Seems like you guys could use it as we look at the soil. It's very dry. Yeah. Is that something that kind of a carryover from last year uh, as we came through the winter? Or just talk about that situation for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was dry all summer last year and we really didn't get any moisture over the winter. Uh, you know, thank God we got the, what, couple feet of snow in January, which really made the, it mellowed the ground out. Everything we tilled last fall, uh, whether we do a lot of strip tilling, it's planting like a garden. I mean, it's, it's, it's really planting nice, um, but it, there's no moisture there. We're, we're going to need some help. How do you sit when it comes to irrigation? Are you dependent on that at all? Oh yeah, like 90%. Okay. Yeah. And that was his own set of challenges, I suppose, too. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like last year, some people were running pivots before even getting in the field. Has anybody done that this year in your neck of the woods or waiting until the seed's in the ground? I have not seen any myself that have been running, but I, if it don't rain by the weekend, I bet Monday will be all the, everybody will go. You know, we're talking a little bit about uh, everybody wants rain, but the kind of rain we get too is a bit dependent upon, or I guess it'll impact your soil. Talk about that. So what I'm seeing with this powdery dry soil is uh, if we were to get a hard rain that comes fast and hard, it's going to 
probably wash a lot of the soil if it's a rolling farm and then it'll I'm afraid it's going to make it hard so if we get this three day soaker you know a little bit here a little bit there I think in my opinion that would be the the best scenario let's talk about your planter setup a little bit you can go pretty fast in this day and age with your planters so I, I did this year uh I put precision uh, speed tube on and V drive and Delta Force. So uh, the old days of planting five mile an hour, I mean, you can, but you know, we have the capabilities of going 10. Uh, I haven't gotten that fast. We're, we're sitting around that seven to seven and a half mile an hour uh, pace. Uh, that seems to be the sweet spot. Uh, in my opinion, that's been the best money I've spent. The combination of the speed and the, the control of the ground, uh, or the, the downforce and the upforce, um, uh, you know, the, the seed being in the, the same depth all the time is, is, that's very nice to, it's just a good peace of mind to have. Yeah, I saw on your tractor you got some stock rollers too. Are you running those while planting or are those kind of a carryover from uh, the harvest season? No, so when we're doing in corn stocks, we split the row with the strip tills so we're always driving on the old row so those just kind of mash them forward so they're not so hard on the tires um, you know in the bean ground like we're standing on obviously we don't need them but if, if uh, we're in the old corn stalks we're always driving on top of them so it's just to help save the tires as i mentioned seems like fingers are crossed we'll get some uh, rain showers here at the end of the week but when you get done planting uh, corn and then beans what's going to be next on your agenda I want to go to the lake <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know then we're looking at obviously pivots. Uh, last year we started watering in May and honestly we never got to quit. Uh, we watered the crop up, we watered it all through the summer and we were still watering uh, some beans while we were picking dry land crops last year. Yeah. It was a very long, long <laughs> irrigation season. Any restrictions for your area right now when it comes to water usage? Not, not yet, but if we have another year like last year, it's it's happening. I mean, there's just, there's no way around it, I'm afraid. Fun conversation there with Lance. Hope he's able to wrap up the planting season and as, and as he said, get out to the lake here shortly. Up next, last week we told you about a new company. It's called Ingenious Ag that's located at Nebraska Innovation Campus. University of Nebraska Lincoln professor and co-founder Dr. James Schnabel, he is leading that venture. He had a conversation with the Dean of Ag Research, Derek McLean, about their efforts. During their conversation, the two discussed how the facilities located at Nebraska Innovation Campus, how they're a great springboard into creating new ag tech, as well as the next generation of ag researchers. Here's their conversation. One thing about facilities I'd like to talk about is where we're sitting today. Yeah. We're at the Greenhouse Innovation Center on the Nebraska Innovation Campus. Yeah. And behind us is actually a piece of equipment, a very complicated yeah. piece of equipment that is collecting data as we speak. So could you give us a little bit of information about what's going on behind us and what, yeah. this, what this system is doing and what it can measure? Yeah. So this is uh, the automated phenotyping greenhouse here at the Greenhouse Innovation Center. Uh, it can grow up to 700 plants and move them through this entire system, measuring the amount of water each plant uses every day, collecting images from five different cameras, uh, including an RGB camera that allows us to reconstruct the architecture of plants in three dimensions and then translate that into computer models where we simulate how those 3D structures will perform in different fields under different planting geometries and different environments as well as a hyperspectral camera, which lets us uh, measure the chemical and biochemical composition of plants and how that is changing over time. A lot of the data that we're able to pull out of that hyperspectral camera is actually the result of algorithms developed by my colleague, uh, Yufan Ga, who is the director of the uh, uh, Greenhouse Innovation Center, or the phenotyping efforts generally here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So, I mean, yeah. this is precision agriculture Absolutely. at its best that's helping us understand what are the inputs that plants need. Is that, is that correct? That, that is correct. I would say one of the really powerful things about this system is that we're collecting data from plants over and over again in a non-destructive fashion. So right. a lot of research that looks at how plants respond to different stresses comes out and measures the properties of the plants either at harvest or one or two times throughout the growing season. With this system, we can monitor the performance of the plants on a day-by-day -day basis throughout their development. And research here at the University of Nebraska, in my lab and other labs in our statistics department, are developing the tools we need to best leverage this new way of monitoring how plants respond day after day. So one of the things to understand about this system is there are only a handful of these uh, across the US, 
And the system here at Nebraska is unique in that we can grow corn and sorghum all the way to maturity. We can grow plants uh, six, seven feet tall in this system and monitor how a corn plant goes through its entire life cycle. This is a unique capability that only exists here at the University of Nebraska. It's part of what positions us so well to be studying not just basic biology, but understanding how our major crops are going to respond in severe weather events, building towards a, a more sustainable, more resilient agricultural system that protects uh, our nation's food supply and our state's economy. Oh, I get it. That's excellent. So what you're really saying is what we're able to do here is we're combining a state-of-the-art greenhouse yeah. facility with a state-of-the-art technology, research technology piece that we combine those to grow the plants to fully yeah. to full maturity and then be able to take continuous measurements throughout that plant's life cycle. And that's really a benefit then for understanding how, what are the inputs that yes. are needed for our producers. Absolutely. We can also use this system as a test bed. Uh, in about a week, we'll have an experiment going on this system measuring uh, a new type of sensor that can monitor the amount of water flowing through the stalk of a corn plant in real time. Uh, we hope that this will uh, ultimately develop into something that can be a product uh, deployed in the field, helping uh, farmers with center pivot systems to monitor just how fast corn plants are burning through the water in the soil and make better decisions about scheduling irrigation uh, than they currently can. And it's only possible because we have this system that can me measure water use in such a precise fashion day after day after day. Other thanks to the Dean of Ag Research, that's Derek McLean, as well as Dr. Schnabel for their conversation, for them sharing it with us. If you'd like to learn more about some of the research happening at Nebraska Innovation Campus, visit the website cap.unl.edu. Up next, I mentioned at the top of the show, we're out in Heather Ramsey country, just north of Bruning, Nebraska. So she was kind enough to join us out here on set to give us a look at what's happening in the grain markets. Heather, good to see you. Good to see you. All right, lots to discuss in today's conversation. A lot of planters rolling, of course, but mm -hmm. first on the corn front, some excitement midweek here. Corn yeah. futures, I saw the current price where we sit today showing uh, the last time I guess we were at that point was February 28th or so. Your mm -hmm. thoughts on the corn market? Yeah, we're back towards the, uh, the top end of the range. I think we're very range bound at this point in time. Uh, we hit some, especially when you look at old crop, we're hitting resistance um, at these levels. I keep an eye on the July because I know right now planters are rolling. Um, if we don't have things priced and protected, what what little is out there kind of unpriced, we're going to be looking into that June, July time frame. And we approach 450 feuds in the July and we really kind of stall out, um, 452, 454 maybe. Um, but then we seem to back off kind of below that. And I think that kind of correlates with what's going on on the cash side of the market. We have May um, sitting between 10 and 12 cents lower on the future side. We're getting enough of a push on basis that 450, Five cash to 460 cash is really the sweet spot to maybe get a little bit to trickle out of the bins. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's it is back higher. The haven't seen these levels since February. Um, limitations though on what old crop can do, just because the whole world seems to feel pretty comfortable with what that supply looks like in the old crop situation, um, and any sort of you know upcoming planting delays or weather issues, whatever, it really is going to get focused, that response on new crop corn and, and, and kind of hit that trajectory going forward. Okay, you brought up the term range bound. I just want to take a second to define that and talk yeah. about what it means to be range bound and why it's tough to break those levels. Range bound really is, um, when you look at a chart situation, it, the chart's probably the easiest place to see it. You'll see some top end limitations and some bottom end support. And when we get into markets like this, it's very choppy, um, not just like week to week, but day to day. So one day we're up three, the next day we're down five. And what we see is just this jockeying back and forth because nobody really has a good feel for what should be happening. You know, whether it's um, experts, the commercials, the managed money, uh, not getting exactly the information on a day to day that would lead us towards putting back it together an actual trend. So what we see is a very defined kind of top end and low end. Uh, we've been seeing this, I would say for the last, you know, six to nine months, we've gone from one range to another. Unfortunately, our ranges have gone lower. What we're seeing now is it looks like a bottoming out has, has started to potentially occur. It feels very strongly, uh, the market does anyways, that wheat 
that's probably put in a low. Since corn and wheat can be some substitutes in a lot of situations, it feels like corn is maybe um, heading that direction as well. So if we get to this top end of the range, everyone's always like, we're gonna go higher. And I was like, nah, we need a real headline to sort of break you out above that. Whether it's a fundamental change on the supply side or the demand side, whether it's a macro change um, that really helps push commodities higher. But right now we're just not seeing any like outlier uh, headline that could really push us higher. So from an old crop standpoint, especially, we've just been encouraging people to continue to you know, trickle out of those bins, get things moved. If you have protection on or hedges on still, it's actually turning into a pretty decent basis opportunity here lately. Um, especially when we look forward, it looks like that spread between corn um, on the May and the July board narrowing up a little bit. So that helps you um, take advantage of this basis uh, push that we're seeing uh, going into May and then potentially June delivery slots. So we're kind of in that time of year where it's not real exciting from a marketing standpoint right now anyways on futures, not real exciting. But if you've done the work in the front end, you get to come in and then sort of take advantage of everybody on a, on a carry situation, on a basis situation. Um, so you're not as cash susceptible and you're just kind of taking off the extra little, um, extra little pennies that we're accumulating right now. Okay, is that a similar story then when it comes to soybeans? Uh, yeah, soybeans are interesting. <laughs> so what we're looking at on soybeans is we've really shifted our focus, I think anyways, the market has to sort of that new crop setup. By new crop, we can be talking about the current harvest in South America and then looking forward into what our planting looks like down the road, you know, six months or so. So right now we're shifting to what does the 24, 25 crop setup look like? Um, this 24 crop, um, for us anyways, I think we're pretty set acreage wise, this isn't changing. I mean, in our neck of the woods, we're on the verge of being done with beans. And I know we're a little bit earlier than a lot of places, but I think that acreage is set. When you look at South America, there's a huge debate going on on whose number is correct. And unfortunately, I think we'll continue to kick the can down the road until we get into May, potentially June, July, um, before anyone wants to admit either victory or defeat on those numbers. Because when you have WASD saying one number versus CONAB saying a completely different number, the spread being as large as it is, these are some serious changes to the global supply and global balance sheet. And um, yeah, I don't know who's gonna end up winning that argument. I do know from a US standpoint, uh, a lot of farmers, a lot of fundamental traders really feel like the USDA WASD has missed the mark. Um, but again, that's the number we trade. That's the number the managed money will trade. And managed money has decided that they're right, which is why we've seen this big sell-off, big short positions. So when we are in these range-bound markets, like we are even in the soybeans, when we get to those top ends of the ranges, unfortunately for the farmer, um, we've got to be able to make decisions and pull the trigger because whether we believe that number is right or not, you know, this is the information we've been get given. And the job is to farm another day, farm another year. And so you've got to take advantage on those high ends of the ranges to protect yourself. Um, whether we think USDA, WASD, CONAB, whoever's right, right? So it all becomes um, a, sort of a, a moot point then and just take advantage of what you can as the farmer. Thanks again to Heather for joining us out here on set to give us her thoughts on the latest happenings when it comes to the grain markets. Coming up next week, we'll be discussing the cattle markets. We'll do so with Market Journal fan favorite, that is Mike Briggs. As always, invite your questions here on the show. So if you have one for me to ask Mike, go ahead and email that in to us. You see the email at the bottom of your screen now and do so by the middle of next week. It's that time of the show where we check in on weather. Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Eric Hunt is standing by with a look at the latest weather forecast. Beautiful sunny day as we broadcast at the moment, Eric, but how are things shaping up as we turn to the week ahead? Well, thanks, Bryce. We are definitely going to have some rain to contend with the next 24 to 36 hours across a good portion of the state. In a lot of cases, that's going to be very beneficial. The responsible culprit for the precipitation is this deep trough that will be moving into the central plains as we head into the day on Sunday. Out ahead of it, we are expecting a chance of some severe weather, particularly across southeastern Nebraska. A sharp boundary will be in place during the day on Saturday. Ahead of that will be warm and humid, potentially even as warm as low 80s across the southeastern corner of the state. Quite a bit cooler out to the west. Uh, but 
What is not in question is the fact we are going to get some rain. The question is maybe a bit how much, but there is a slight chance of some heavy precipitation across pretty much the entire I-80 corridor out into uh, eastern Wyoming uh, with a little better chances of excessive rainfall to our southeast. In terms of storm total, now again, this is also considering the rainfall Thursday and Friday, but storm totals are again widespread two inches across the most of the state. Uh, was I would guess there would be pockets of east and eastern and maybe possible possibly parts of central Nebraska where we could get four or five inches of precipitation. Now again, that's a little bit much in three or four days, but this is also rainfall that we really could use. Uh, in terms of temperatures for the next week, we are looking at it generally being above average as we get in starting Monday and then probably lasting through most of the week uh, with temperatures probably being particularly warm on Wednesday and then probably again on Friday. Uh, and the CPC also is pretty bullish on the first week of May being pretty warm. And again, I think this is going to be a signal we're going to see quite a bit of here in the next, uh, say, two or three weeks. Uh, in terms of uh, potential storms coming into the rest of the week, there is a storm system moving in to the Northern Plains midweek, and then another one probably is going to be moving into the Northern Plains as we head to later the week. Both will bring chances of precipitation to the state. I think it's a little harder to pinpoint details for exactly right now, uh, but there definitely will be chances for some uh, scattered showers or storms uh, pretty much statewide Wednesday, then maybe again, certainly by Friday and Saturday when models are currently a bit more bullish on that being uh, potential for a half inch inch of rain, particularly across the eastern third of the state. Uh, the CPC also was showing pretty good signal for precipitation across the entire central U.S. And in terms of precipitation, so again, the last seven days up till Thursday morning, we had not seen much precipitation in the state except for maybe a couple of spots of southwestern Nebraska, which is again very welcome down here, and a couple of small pockets down here in southeastern Nebraska. For the most part, the last week has been quite dry across the state. Uh, we did see some improvement on the drought monitor from last week. Now, again, uh, some of this improvement we saw here in northeastern Nebraska, like in Wayne and Dixon and Cedar counties, was uh, because the uh, rainfall that fell last Tuesday, a lot of that came after the cutoff for last week's map, so it was reflected on this week's map instead. Uh, we also had quite a bit of freezing. We also saw uh, freezing temperatures or below freezing temperatures across the majority of the state uh, this past week, and with a lot of places seeing uh, two days in a row of sub freezing temperatures, with uh, temperatures being particularly chilly across uh, the western portion of the state. Matter of fact, there was a couple spots in Kimball County did not even hit freezing for a high last Saturday. It'll be much warmer this weekend. Soil temperatures have bounced back quite a bit over the last uh, four or five days of being warmer, and they're mostly in the mid 50s to low 60s statewide. Soil moisture, again, uh, it's not totally bone dry down here, but we really need this moisture coming to the state uh, across eastern Nebraska and again across ports of southwestern Nebraska. Thanks. Back to you, Bryce. All right. Thank you very much for that update, Eric. We sure appreciate it. Well, up next, a lot of planters are rolling across the heartland, and some of them, for the past couple of years now, have been planting into some dry conditions. And there's some things, if that's you, that you want to keep in mind. To that point, recently had the chance to catch up with Extension Educator Steve Melbourne to get some tips when it comes to planting into dry conditions. Market Journal's Mike Straub is standing by with this story. Mike? The Nebraska Drought Monitor shows 55% of Nebraska in moderate to exceptional drought. Soil condition is perhaps the most critical component to planting because soil conditions set the stage for decisions we make regarding planter adjustments, which crop is planted, and planting depth. When planting into drier conditions, increased down pressure is most likely necessary. Yeah, the soil moisture this spring is kind of all over the place. Some places have had some really nice rains and some haven't had quite as much and, and so obviously when we go out to the field with the planter we need there to be sufficient moisture in the soil to make the planter work correctly. Now our planters have a lot of adjustments on them and we can adjust them to make them work in you know wetter soils or drier soils but we really need to think about that when we go to the field and particularly last spring we really worried about just extremely dry soils and some places are that way again and uh, there may be an opportunity where one would want to think about some putting some water on to get the planter to go in the ground deep enough. That's probably the main reason you'd think about it. Uh, typically though, we think about if we can get the seed in the ground reasonably decent, that if we're gonna maybe incorporate some herbicide or something, we can also get some water to the seed to take off if it's dry. Obviously the goal is that we're not going to need to run the center pivot right after we plant. You know, we, we don't need the moisture this time of year typically, but uh, you know, it's a, uh, getting the seed off to a good start is a really high priority, so it is something to consider. Watering before planting is recommended if the planter needs higher soil moisture levels to work well. If the soil is too hard, too powdery, or cloddy, it may be worth running the pivot. Otherwise, the recommendation is to run the pivot after you plant if needed. Well, I think with the early irrigation, sometimes we take a look at a field and see what it's got for subsoil moisture. 
You know, obviously alfalfa is a place that uses the water really, really deep, and if we've got an irrigated alfalfa field, we want to get some water on them early and try and get some down into those deeper depths, you know, maybe four, five, six feet uh, with an established alfalfa stand. When we're looking at a corn or soybean field that was reasonably well watered last year, typically it only takes maybe two to four inches of water to completely refill that profile. And I guess at this point, I wouldn't be thinking too much about that. Uh, you know, we're probably going to get some rain here in May, and our crop water use is always below um, the amount of rain that we typically receive in, in May. Uh, and so I wouldn't worry too much about it just yet. But if we get on into the spring or into the summer some, and we still see there's a, a dry root zone below our irrigated crops, we may want to think about putting some water on. Now, if it's a field that wasn't watered very well last year because of low well capacity or something like that, then we might want to think about putting some water on ahead of time and refilling the profile. But typically, we like to wait and put the water on during the summer when the crop's actually using it, not, not ahead of time. Ensuring a good soil seed contact is key to emergent success. Aiming for close to two inches is a good consideration for both corn and soybeans. Adjusting the planter for different field conditions might be necessary. Well, when we're out with setting the planter, you know, just make sure that we get the seed into the ground a couple inches and, and uh, we're getting good seed to soil contact and that's the best way to do it. But if we really need to have a little bit of water put on with the center pivot, it's, it's money well spent. But we really want to try and just adjust the planter um, each field, you know, take a look at it as conditions change. You know, even a, a 10 or 1500 inch of rain can really change the soil conditions and really need for us to take a look at the planter and make sure it's still set correctly. Running center pivots early in the season do have some extra challenges. The recommendation is not to run a pivot when temperatures are below 40 degrees. Bare powdery soils will seal over very easily from rain or irrigation. And if you do irrigate, make sure that you put on enough water to get down to the moist soil below. This is a problem with tillage or where fertilizer knives have been used and dried out the soil. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Mike Straub. Thank you very much for that update, Mike. We sure appreciate that and those comments from Steve Melvin when it comes to planting into dry conditions. If you are looking submitted for additional information on this topic and all the latest when it comes to planting season, visit cropwatch.unl.edu. That is about all the time we have for this week's broadcast. Do appreciate you joining us today. As a reminder, you can keep up with our team and all the latest activities by subscribing to the Market Journal on YouTube. You can also like and follow us on all the social media channels. We hope to see you back here next time. But until then, I'm Bryce Duskett, wishing you a safe and productive week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.